Hello and welcome to Say That Again Slowly, the Cambridge Festival podcast where students at Cambridge University chat with the experts who have contributed to the festival. We try to pair up students with researchers and authors from very different disciplines to bring things back to basics. There are no stupid questions here. My name is Rebecca King. I'm a second year PhD student in the Faculty of English Literature, studying the concept of dangerous magic on the early modern stage. Today, I'll be interviewing Wallace Arthur, who is an evolutionary biologist and science writer, and is the author of The Biological Universe, Life in the Milky Way and Beyond, which was published by the Cambridge University Press in 2020. Hello, Wallace. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, Rebecca. It's a pleasure. Um, I've got loads of questions for you, and I, a few of them at the beginning, I'll admit, are a bit influenced by my background in English. Um, I've got some questions about um, storytelling and how that uh, intersects with maybe even interferes with um, some of the science that you've been doing. So um, what I wanted to start off with was by saying that I really like the way that in the book, um, you've included all of these key hypotheses that the reader needs to understand um, the chapters and the, and the sections, like at the beginning of, of each of the sections. And so for the reader who hasn't hasn't read the book yet, it, one of the things that sort of stood out to me from a lot of the key hypotheses is that they have to do with looking at our Earth, our planet, um, to make sensible guesses about what other planets with life on them might look like. Is that, is that a fair summary of one of the kind of central themes of the book? Yes, it certainly is. Um, and we have this problem uh, when trying to think about possible extraterrestrial life. It's sometimes called the sample size of one problem. So we only have one planet that we know about that has life, obviously our own. Um, and so it's all we have to go on. We, we, we've got lots of information about millions of different species of life form on our own planet and no information whatsoever yet about any life forms elsewhere. And so uh, we naturally start from the point of um, thinking, well, is it gonna be like life here or isn't it? And, 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 and maybe how like uh, life here is it gonna be? And uh, there's, there's um, uh, a scene from the original series of Star Trek <laughs> that I always think is a really good uh, backcloth for thinking about this, uh, if you like, this continuum of, you know, how like or unlike uh, life on Earth is extraterrestrial life likely to be. And, and this scene that I have in mind has got Captain Kirk, mm -hmm. so a human, and there are two aliens with him. And one of them is Mr. Spock. And so he's really very, very like a human. Hardly surprising since he's being played by a human. Um, uh, uh, but the other creature that's in this scene is a, it looks a bit like a rock. It's a, it's a creature made of silicon. Okay, so it's, it's a bit animal-like. It moves around, it can do things, but it's not even based on carbon. It's based on silicon. And I think that uh, the right answer um, in terms of how similar extraterrestrial life is uh, to us is somewhere in between Mr. Spock and the rock-like creature that's made of silicon. I think it's very likely to be based on carbon, mm. and some of it may be a bit animal-like, um, but a creature that only differs from humans externally uh, in the shape of the ears, that seems a little unlikely to me. So I think those, those two creatures, Mr. Spock and the rock creature, kind of bracket uh, where we should be looking. That brings me on actually really nicely to my first proper question, which was about imagination, because from the beginning of the book, um, when you mention our ancestors in Africa looking up at the stars and all the way through, there's a lot of contemplation and I guess a little bit of guesswork and imagination. Um, I really like the section in the in the um, I think it's part one where you talk about you do a meditation on Orion, uh, which I appreciate because it's the only constellation I can recognize. <laughs> um, but you, you mentioned the different colors of the stars and how far away they are and how hot or cold they are and, and what that means about the possibility of there being planets with life 
um, uh, near them. Uh, and it reminded me of one of my favorite passages from uh, the Thomas Hardy novel, Far From the Madding Crowd, where the, the sort of shepherd protagonist is on a hillside and he he actually is, is describing exactly the same stars, which was, I recognize some of the names because I remembered the description and he's talking about their colors as well. He's talking about it from a purely poetic perspective and he's thinking about the smallness of, of, of himself in the universe. But I wondered, it kind of made me think about the, um, the significance of imagination um, and what role that plays in the field of astrobiology since we only have this sam sample size of one and also how a scientist uses imagination without getting carried away? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. I, I, I mean, uh, the thing is that imagination is important in all branches of science. Uh, we have to get away from the idea of the dusty scientist sitting there in a lab or a museum or whatever, and uh, only dealing with uh, evidence. So uh, science, to my mind, is an interplay between imagination and evidence. So we, we, we think about possibilities, uh, we turn possibilities into concrete hypotheses, and then we try to bring evidence to bear in some way. And our astrobiology has some ways to go yet because we, we haven't yet discovered the evidence, but I think it's gonna come sooner than most people think. And, and so, I mean, imagination in science in general um, is looked at in both a positive way and a negative way. And, and, and I think that's just right, because in a positive way, when you come up with hypotheses, uh, you're using the imagination. And that's great. And it, if imagination is kind of juggled uh, to and fro with, with evidence, with testing, um, then, then that works as so science. Imagination, that's the good side of imagination. If you build imagination on imagination on more imagination so that you get carried away and you never do any testing, then that's not called hypothesizing, that's called engaging in rampant speculation. And that's the bad side of imagination. So if you kind of use imagination wisely and juggle backwards and forwards with facts, with evidence, with, with, with testing, experimental testing, observational testing, that, then that's good science. And imagination is really a big part of that. So um, I think we should look at imagination in the positive way, mostly, but just be careful not to let ourselves get carried away with it. Good advice. And yeah, it, in a similar vein, um, you briefly, so you touched a bit on, um, you talked about um, uh, gaseous aliens, aliens made of gas, and the idea that um, you sort of talked briefly about that and how can possibly discount that even though or, or that shouldn't be our main those kinds of aliens shouldn't be our main focus even though they often pop up in science fiction uh, but then you also talked about I love the bit bits where you talked about triffids um, and how actually feasibly there could be such a thing as a triffid and so I love that sort of uh, the, the, the idea that science fiction is also dealing with all of these um these questions without us really thinking about it too much but but you have a very different perspective on which science fictions are more feasible and which are, are less feasible and I wondered about how much in general you have to engage with all this myth making about aliens um, and whether cultural forces that kind of work upon what we imagine aliens to be ever get in the way of how people discuss the topic or respond to the book. I don't think it gets in the way because it's all ideas and ideas are interesting. Um, and again, you have to, you know, juggle between ideas and, and, and evidence uh, and, and a scientific approach where you don't just accept any old ideas. Uh, now, actually, the idea of gaseous life forms, uh, the place I first read about that was a book um, by a guy who died recently called Jack Cohen, a British biologist who uh, got interested in extraterrestrial life. And he was keen on making sure we didn't make too many assumptions that life had to be pretty much like us. And so I think he deliberately invented this gas cloud of life, the, a living cloud, if you like, um, uh, to, as a way of keeping open-minded. His other creature was a giant millipede. So we had the gas cloud and the giant millipede. Um, <laughs> and of course, in the, you go back in the fossil record and there were fossil uh, giant millipedes, mm -hmm. um, but not as far as we know, uh, uh, organisms made of gas clouds. I think imagining life in an, an entirely 
um, uh, gaseous form is very hard. I think now a lot depends on how you define life, of course. And I mean, for me, I tend to think in terms of three things, reproduction, inheritance, and metabolism. And it's very hard to imagine a chemical metabolism of the sort that's um, part and parcel of life um, if everything's gaseous. Mm. So my guess is that uh, Jack Cohen's wonderful idea about a living cloud of gas is probably, dare I say it, pie in the sky. Um, I don't think it's likely, but you know, we, we always have to end up with, well, but it could be. Mm. Um, so, you know, we keep an open mind. It was, it was that, uh, there's that, there's that nice expression that's attributed to many people, including uh, Carl Sagan, who of course was a big, big name in this field. Uh, it's important to keep an open mind, but not so open that your brains fall out. And I think that's just right. That's, that's the stance we should adopt. Lovely, yeah. Um, yeah, I, um, I, as I mentioned in the introduction, like I'm, I study the history of magical knowledge seeking and I, uh, I'm an atheist. I, I don't believe in magic. I just love stories about it, which explore some of the same ideas that science fiction does actually sometimes about, um, you know, what kind of knowledge is dangerous, too dangerous for humans to handle? You know, should you do something just because you can? The kind of Jurassic Park question. Um, and uh, what, what it would be like to have the kind of knowledge and power traditionally associated with gods. Um, I'm still figuring out how to um, have conversations with people who do believe in magic and do believe in these traditions and who have an interest in my work because of that without patronizing them and talking down to them, um, but also without conceding that I could ever think that magic is literally real. So I wondered whether you ever find yourself in a similar position where someone has a very strong belief maybe not even coming from a scientific background, but they have a very personal belief in a particular uh, form of extraterrestrial life and they kind of expect you to be on the same page. Do you ever have to have those um, maybe slightly difficult conversations? I think the thing that I've noticed most um, is when giving talks about uh, the possibility of extraterrestrial life to general audiences, so quite often, uh, events at astronomical observatories where members of the public have paid and have come along to uh, hopefully look through telescopes, but also hear a few talks. Um, I've noticed uh, a definite uh, tendency for people who are uh, conventionally religious to have a kind of a, a mental block about, uh, particularly about intelligent alien life. Mm -hmm. So I quite often have asked for a show of hands about who thinks there is or isn't um, uh, extraterrestrial life. And I usually do it in two ways. I ask about, uh, if you like, green slime. So something that's just like algae on rocks. Uh, and then I also ask about something that's human level intelligence or perhaps even above. Um, and I've noticed that uh, people who are atheists or agnostics or sort of generally, um, let's say, not uh, conventionally religious and, and, and indeed not uh, believers in magic, that's not something that I've tended to connect with so much, but um, and perhaps they believed in that too. But um, I, yeah, I've tended to find them receptive to the idea that there could be green slime on multiple planets out there but not intelligent life. And so I've, I, to me that, the first time I encountered that reaction, it came as a surprise because I don't see why a deity couldn't um, look after, <laughs> in quotes, uh, more than one uh, species of intelligent uh, creature. I mean, I personally doubt if such a deity exists and is looking after anybody. So I'm perhaps a bit towards you. I, I think I oscillate between atheism and agnosticism. One of my great scientific heroes is Thomas Henry Huxley, mm -hmm. AKA uh, Darwin's bulldog, who coined the term agnosticism. So I rather like the term agnosticism. And I kind of veer between atheism and agnosticism. Uh, I think I'd, I, actually agnosticism is good because it's the ultimate open-mindedness. Um, uh, but, but yeah, people who are conventionally religious seem to have some kind of 
constraints on what they're prepared to accept in terms of extraterrestrial life. Mm -hmm. And I find that strange. I can't really relate to it personally because I'm not personally of that, that sort of uh, persuasion, that belief. Um, and I think it's a pity uh, to close your mind to any possibilities uh, about what might be out there. I mean, yeah, in terms of magic, that, to me, that's a really fascinating question because I've had little connection uh, with that. I think actually one or two of the people, I, I also have given talks as well as um, uh, at, at astronomical observatories. I've given talks at pubs, which run things like cosmology nights. Cool. And I think, I think once or twice I've, I've suspected that there were a couple of people at those kind of do's who perhaps dabbled in the occult. <laughs> um, but I, I was, I was perhaps nervous to probe too deeply in, <laughs> sure. into their connections with that kind of thing. So, but yeah, no, it's, it's really interesting that you talk about intelligence um, as a kind of stumbling block because it seemed to me to be quite a, a, a constant concern of the book. And you talk about intelligence a lot throughout in lots of different ways sure. and how. Yeah. And we're really only just coming into an understanding of the different kinds of intelligence. Uh, that in, exist on Earth, you know, so crow, you mentioned crows using tools, you mentioned um, octopuses, there's been a couple of good books out recently about octopus intelligence. Um, yeah, I can't remember what my question was going to be based on that, but that 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 seemed to me to be a really interesting um, area. Oh, I, I was going to mention that um, I, I recently, for this podcast, actually, for another episode, I interviewed some researchers who are looking into animal testing, and reducing and refining and making more humane um, the, the animal testing that is done. And they use this measure of sentience, and this is this is in the law about how you test animals. You're supposed to look for the animal of least sentience that you can feasibly perform and reliably perform the experiments on. And I, I wonder whether that, that will be disrupted in the future as we learn a bit more about what sentience might mean and intelligence might mean. But that, that struck me as a really fascinating kind of ongoing open question about what exactly we're looking for when we look for intelligence. And you mentioned um, SETI, it's, what is it search for extraterrestrial intelligence? Um, yes. Yeah, and I wonder sort of how, I, I wonder just how, how important in general, if you could sum up overall how important you think searching for intelligence is as opposed to in searching for, for life. Um, what, what, okay. Where do you think they kind of, balance how do you think they balance um against one another right well following everything that you've just said i could talk for a very long time <laughs> um i'll try to um answer your question i mean you're absolutely right with regard to animal testing which is a whole different area uh going for the least sentience is absolutely the right thing to do um, I, I, and I'm glad to see that uh, octopuses are now being uh, acknowledged to be uh, essentially sentient beings, easily the most sentient of the invertebrate world, mm. uh, and, and quite probably more so sentient themselves than some species in the vertebrate world. And, and yeah, the, as you say, there have been some marvelous books, including the one called Other Minds, and that's just when you look at an octopus, it's just like you're looking at another mind mm -hmm. through those very familiar looking eyes, which are, you know, a, a product of convergent evolution. They're very like uh, our own eyes. Um, yeah, so, uh, but you're right. Um, there are two very different searches uh, in terms of extraterrestrial life. One is just searching for anything that's alive. Just something that meets our definition of life and it could well be just green slime it could be it could be purple slime as well it could be any kind of but just something that's made of cells and metabolizing and reproducing uh, so that's the search for life the search for intelligence or intelligent life um, is a very different endeavor i mean they use quite different techniques and they're often different people, different scientists involved in them. Um, if you're just looking for life of any kind, and it doesn't have to be intelligent, then I think the best thing to look for are biosignature gases in the atmospheres of planets. And 
personally, I think that by far and away the best biosignature gas to look for is oxygen. And also along with that ozone, because of course there's a, there's a balance, a chemical balance between oxygen and ozone in our atmosphere and indeed probably in other atmospheres too. Um, so I think uh, it's really important to start analyzing the atmospheres of Earth-like exoplanets. I mean, I guess a lot of your um, listeners will know, uh, but uh, exoplanets are those planets beyond our own solar system. So beyond the likes of Mars and Jupiter and Saturn, the ones that we have uh, nice familiar names for, the ones that are orbiting other stars, not our own sun. Uh, and we're now able to do this uh, analysis of exoplanet atmospheres, which is incredible. We, but nothing of this sort was done until about the turn of the millennium. So we've only been doing it for 20 odd years. And to begin with, it was all done in huge Jupiter-like planets, which are not likely abodes for life. But we're now just beginning to get to the point where we can analyze the atmospheres of smaller planets, Earth-like planets in some cases. And I think that's going to be the source of really important discoveries over the next few years, few decades. Mm. Uh, so that's one side of it. Then there's looking for intelligent life. And looking for intelligent life, um, or oh, perhaps you would call it listening for intelligent life, we're really uh, looking for, for the most part, radio transmissions. Now, it's not the only thing to look for, uh, but it seems the most promising to me. And so we are listening for uh, radio signals um, as opposed to just, um, you know, incurring radio from lots of non-living sources. I mean, there, there, there was a thing discovered again, uh, not so long ago in the last 20 years, um, fast radio bursts. Uh, some people just call them FRBs, but I'll call them fast radio bursts because they don't like initials. Um, and fast radio bursts are fascinating. In some cases, they're actually repeated. So you get a burst of fast radio stuff coming from some particular point in the sky. And then if you keep listening, you get more of them coming from the same point in the sky. And you think, well, well, that's a bit interesting, isn't it? But it rather looks as if these are coming from physical sources, not biological sources. So they're fascinating, but they're not probably going to be interesting from an astrobiology point of view. Yeah. But we keep listening for messages that have some kind of repeating structure, something that suggests they're coming from a life form. And uh, I would guess that some kind of incoming signal uh, uh, in the radio frequency is going to be our first evidence of, of extraterrestrial intelligent life. So on the one hand, we're looking for uh, biosignature gas, gases like oxygen. On the other hand, we're looking for what are now often called technosignatures, such as an incoming radio message that has structure that defies a non-biological source. And I don't see these as competing. I see them as two strands in parallel, some people pursuing one, some people pursuing the other. I am personally, as a biologist, I'd be absolutely fascinated to find green slime on exoplanet X out there, but I'd be equally in, uh, amazed to find incoming radio signals uh, that have come from uh, an intelligent civilization. So I think we just put everything we can into both of these strands of the search and yeah. see what happens. And you mentioned um, that you think that we probably will have some kind of evidence within the next couple of decades. Do you, do you have a guess about which of the strands will deliver the evidence? <laughs> Yes, yes, I do. Uh, the thing is, we've been, this, the SETI endeavor has been going on for, since about 1960, when Frank Drake and others uh, started uh, listening for, for radio signals from, from other worlds. And although it's been greatly expanded, the search is pretty much the same as it was then. And so, over um, the time between 1960 and the early 2020s, so over 60 odd years, uh, there has been, if you like, no progress because although we've expanded the search, we've looked in lots more directions, uh, we've listened in lots more directions, we actually haven't found anything yet which really looks as if it's a transmission from an alien civilization. So given that 
kind of flatlining. Um, if you ask me, well, you know, will it be in the next couple of years that we suddenly go from the flat line to the peak and it's real, you know, it's a real incoming message. I don't think it's going to happen. I, it wouldn't surprise me if it happens in the next 50 years, but I don't think it's likely to happen in the next five years. However, with regard to uh, detecting biosignatures uh, of some kind of uh, photosynthetic life out there, um, the green slime again, something like that, um, I think that there's a good chance that that will happen uh, on more like a timescale of the next five years. Because we've gone, if, if you look at the, the, the sort of milestones in, in discoveries about exoplanets, the first exoplanets weren't discovered until the 1990s. Mm. Now we've, we've, we've passed the 5,000 mark. We, we actually have more than 5,000 uh, named exoplanets, confirmed exoplanets. Um, as I said before, we didn't do any um, uh, atmospheric analysis of exoplanets until about the year 2000. We didn't discover the first Earth-like exoplanet until 2014. This is a year that should be really emblazoned in people's minds. It's far more important than 1914 when the First World War started. 2014 was the year when somebody discovered a planet called uh, Kepler 186F. Not a very memorable name. We need to give it a better name. But it was the first Earth-like planet discovered in a habitable zone around a, a, uh, a star. Um, there were lots of other planets orbiting that same star, but they weren't in the habitable zone, and so they're probably not interesting. But uh, this particular planet is in the habitable zone and might well be inhabited. 2014 was a very important year. Now, that's only seven years ago. And then there have been other milestones since. And, and, and so basically, things are coming along very quickly. Mm -hmm. And so you ask, well, how long is it going to be before... We analyze the atmosphere of an Earth-like exoplanet in the habitable zone and find oxygen. Well, I'd say in the next few years, because um, we've got lots of bits of kit that are capable of doing this. Yeah. And, <coughs> excuse me, um, I, I, I think there's so many planets out there to look at. And then people will say, oh, well, you might discover oxygen. What's the big deal? Oxygen can arise in other ways than biological ones and it's true it can it can operate uh, sorry it can it can um, emanate from geological process and also from what are called photochemical processes reactions that are happening in the atmosphere that are driven by light coming in but they don't need any biology to drive them and so if um, oxygen can arise from geological means from biological means and photo, from photochemical means, what's, what's the big deal about finding oxygen? Why should we even call it a biosignature gas? But here's the thing. Remember this concept of the habitable zone, the kind of the, the zone around the, a star where the temperature is just right for life. It's sometimes called the Goldilocks zone because the porridge, is, the porridge is just right. Yeah. And so here we are. Earth is in, in the, the habitable zone around the sun or the Goldilocks zone around the sun. Now we've discovered lots of exoplanets that are in the habitable zone or Goldilocks zone around other suns or other stars, call them which, whichever you like. Um, now, here, here, here's a question. Um, when, we just, when we start discovering oxygen in the atmospheres of planets, we can ask the question, where are those planets? Are they in the habitable zone around their particular local sun? Or are they not? If every time we find oxygen, it happens to be in a planet in the habitable zone, and every time we don't find oxygen, that's the planets outside the habitable zone, eventually, that's going to be uh, no coincidence. Mm. So eventually, mm. that's going to be because the oxygen is a biosignature gas. Mm. And I think we're not that far away from that kind of finding. Admittedly, we're, we're a few planets away from finding it because we have to find not just one planet with oxygen, but let's say a dozen before the coincidence will look like, no, it can't be a coincidence, okay? But um, I think that's where we're heading for.
it's really exciting. And uh, you mentioned um, green, <laughs> green slime quite a lot, and maybe purple slime. And I wanted to ask about that because you mentioned um, that there's a kind of sulfur bacteria, which is purple. Um, yeah. Is it possible? So I was thinking about this because Earth is so characterized in our minds as a green and blue planet. You know, it's it's got a very distinctive, um, pretty, <laughs> we think, uh, color to it. And I wondered what color are these planets in the Goldilocks zone? Are they all going to be blue and green or might we find a planet that's uh, full of life, but it just happens to be um, purple sulfur bacteria kind of life? <laughs> Yeah, I think I think a, a, an inhabited planet could be pretty much any color. Uh, you don't even have to go to weird groups of microbes to find different colors than green. You just have to look at a copper beech tree instead of an ordinary beech tree. And the copper beech tree has this beautiful purpley copper color, but it photosynthesizes perfectly well. Um, it actually has got chlorophyll, which makes most plants green but it's got other photosynthetic pigments as well, which end up making it copper. And uh, the, the, those purple sulfur bacteria, um, they're pretty weird and wonderful creatures and, and they have a different photosynthetic pigment as well and they end up looking purple. So yeah, I mean, if on other worlds, um, there are lots of uh, organisms that are making their living by using light to produce biological energy. So they're photosynthesizing in the general sense of that term, they could be all manner of colors. And I mean, if you, if you go down to um, uh, a, a rocky shoreline on earth, you can in some cases find uh, brown algae, sea, seaweeds of the brown algae group, other seaweeds of the red algae group, and other seaweeds of the green algae group, like sea lettuce, for example, and here you have three very different, equally beautiful colors, uh, just because the, the, the organisms concerned are all um, photosynthesizing. They're using photosynthetic pigments to turn uh, light energy into biological energy, but they've got different uh, photosynthetic pigments. And so they end up different colors. Another question about color is, you know, uh, would a purple planet look purple uh, to any animals that happen to be on that planet. Uh, the whole thing of even what we call visible light, it's, it's a very subjective thing. So, so here we are as humans, we talk about one section of the electromagnetic spectrum as visible light. And then there's the radio section on one side and there's ultraviolet and, 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 and X-rays and all these other um, sections that we recognize, but it's all very subjective. The visible section is called that because of the precise range that humans can see in, but other animals on Earth see different uh, ranges. So some see into the ultraviolet compared with us, some see a little bit into the infrared. And if you're then talking about extraterrestrial life, which is likely to be even more different from us than uh, other animals on Earth, then um, what is purple? <laughs> you know, what is visible? What is purple? What is green? Uh, it becomes very very fluid. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And I wondered, so would a, would a planet need to have a sea? Could a planet that had life on it have little enough water or water in small enough pockets that from, from space um, it wouldn't have big seas like Earth does? Um, I think probably life needs water. And I think most scientists would agree with that. But how much water is a much, much more difficult question. Um, I would have thought that uh, if all there was on a planet was very occasional, very transient, small puddles of water, which are prone to drying up almost as soon as they've formed, then the idea of life evolving there is probably a bit unrealistic. Mm. On the other hand, I very much doubt if you need to have seas. Um, so for example, on uh, Saturn's moon Titan, there are lakes 
some of which are about the size of the Great Lakes uh, in North America. Now, unfortunately, these lakes are not lakes of water. They're lakes of liquid hydrocarbons. But supposing they were lakes of water, or suppose that somewhere else there are lakes the size of uh, the North American Great Lakes, um, I would have thought that's easily big enough uh, for life to evolve. Um, I mean, the thing is, we don't actually know where life started. Uh, Darwin had the lovely idea of what he called a warm little pond. Um, some people think life started in warm little ponds. Other people think that life started in uh, large expanses of, of open, shallow sea, uh, kind of warmish, whatever that means. And other people think that maybe life started in these deep ocean hydrothermal vents, which are incredibly hot. We don't know as yet. We don't know where it started. But I think that anywhere where there's a substantial amount of water, uh, liquid water, is fair game. And so probably we don't actually need seas. But there's another aspect to this, and that is there are some, there, there are thought to be some what are called water worlds, where there is actually a global ocean and there's uh, no emergent land. <clears throat> and so there's an interesting question, well, what about that? Would it be okay to have life if there's no emergent land? Maybe. We really don't know. <laughs> but I think we, we should certainly look at those planets too. Yes. I wanted to ask a bit more about skeletons because this book made me think a lot about skeletons in a way that I hadn't really before. Um, and you talk about how, you know, we can reasonably assume because of the way that gravity works that any kind of life form that is in any way substantial is going to need some way of uh, fighting against gravity and being able to move around. And, and you talked about um, different kinds of uh, bones and shells and uh, cartilages and also wood uh, in plants. And I wondered sort of what the kind of, um, you talked about brackets earlier between, you know, what's possible and, and less possible. What are the kind of possibilities for skeletal types and materials? Could you have a creature that has, uh, that lives on a planet where everything is, you know, diamond <laughs> and they've kind of made a shell out of diamond, it's very hard or, you know, like, what are the kind of other possible um, skeletons that animals could have? <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting. Um, even if you simply uh, look at animals on Earth, but look into less well-known corners of the animal kingdom, if I can, if I can put it that way, um, th there's a very interesting uh, group of animals called glass sponges. And glass sponges have, as the name sort of suggests, they have a, a glassy skeleton. It's, it's actually made of uh, silicon. And uh, this is very interesting because uh, in, in terms of extraterrestrial life, there's sometimes a debate about, you know, silicon is one of the carbon group elements. Might there be life based on silicon rather than based on carbon? Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of metabolizing, you know, uh, soft, squishy, cellular type life, I think the answer is probably not. Uh, but, there's absolutely no problem making a, a skeleton out of silicon as the glass sponges show us. And so I think uh, what evolution either on this planet or another planet will do is it will uh, lead to the appearance of skeletons based on whatever material is common in the environments concerned. And so if uh, you happen to be somewhere where silicon is, is uh, very abundant, then uh, evolution can lead to the, uh, the production of, of a siliceous skeleton as opposed to a calcareous one. And I think, uh, again, if you leave the Earth and, and, and think about exoplanets and evolution on exoplanets rather than evolution here, I don't see any reason why it should be different. I mean, natural selection works in a very definite way. It uses what's available. Um, you can't really have selection for perfection, you know, or selection for some abstract notion, you can only have selection working with what's there. And so I would have thought whatever material is locally abundant, wherever you are in the universe, uh, will be game for potentially being made into skeletons. I mean, I, I personally wouldn't expect to see 
uh, stainless steel skeletons. Um, <laughs> if you're talking about natural life, uh, as opposed to something artificial, uh, but who knows? I think whatever's whatever's locally abundant will what? be fair game as long as it's potentially makeable into something hard. What if um, what if in the future humans have driven ourselves to extinction, but we've left behind a lot of plastics that aren't going anywhere? Do you reckon there could be animals that, because plastic is in abundance, start to use plastic for their skeletons? We could actually be um, providing those abundant resources for a whole new type of animal in the future? Um, that's a, a fascinating question and one that I've absolutely never <laughs> thought of before. So this is completely off the cuff. But you know what your question makes me think about is hermit crabs. Because uh, effectively, mollusks make shells, you know, sea snails make shells, and then they die and they leave the shell. And the shell is just basically their rubbish, their detritus, their, 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 their waste, their litter, if you like. You know, I mean, the seashells look beautiful to us and bits of plastic don't, but that's very subjective. So a group of organisms which have nothing to do with the mollusks, crabs, which are, which are arthropods, of course, not mollusks, they have evolved a very peculiar body shape so that they just nip inside these discarded shells and use them as their homes. And as they grow bigger, they have to discard one shell and take another shell. Now, uh, if we uh, leave all this plastic around, it, it depends very much on the size and shape of the bits of plastic. But if you can imagine some little plastic tubes, for example, or little, little plastic vials, um, from the point of view of something like a hermit crab, it doesn't know the difference between that and a discarded molluscan shell. So why not in the future have things like hermit crabs that evolve to live inside our dis discarded plastic vials, I think that's entirely possible. I mean, the, the things that are evolving, they don't know whether it's a natural product or something that, um, you know, horrible humans who, who throw plastic into the oceans ha ha have done. Mm. Uh, it's, it's, it's just, if it's useful, uh, evolution may use it. I, I, this kind of leads me all to my final question, which was to, to ask a bit about um, the relationship between astrobiology and climate change, because we've we've had a lot of speakers in this podcast who, who've come to talk about climate change and what we can do, what we should be doing. And I wonder whether, you know, when we're looking at the sky and we're, we're imagining these new planets, you know, the extent to which that in, in any way kind of reflects upon how how we're looking at our planet um, in order to save it. I, I just wondered whether the fields are particularly connected, whether it's something you spend a lot of time sort of talking about or thinking about, or whether they're still quite kind of distinct from one another. Uh, I, I would say connected rather than distinct. Um, uh, people often use the, uh, the phrase for this branch of science, astrobiology, because they, you know, it's kind of putting together astronomy and biology, but actually, there's something in this sandwich, if you like, astronomy and biology are the bread, and inside the sandwich is, 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 is the thing we call planetary science. And planetary science has a lot of different components. I mean, part of planetary science is geology, part of it is ecology, part of it is climate science. Um, and in terms of understanding exoplanets and their potential for life, climate science is very important. I mean, analyzing planetary atmospheres, as I've said, is, is perhaps going to be where we get our first evidence for extraterrestrial life from. Um, but uh, climate science uh, is uh, applicable across all planets, including Earth. And on Earth, uh, climate science ranges from, like, like most science, from pure to applied. And so we're interested in understanding the climate of Earth and how that's changed over the very long term, over the course of evolutionary time. But we're also interested in climate science from a practical perspective because we want to be able to quantify, we, in fact, we are beginning to be able to quantify quite well the ways in which humans are changing the climate and the potential negative effects of that and, and, and what we can potentially do about it. Um, something that always strikes me as uh, important is to distinguish between 
effects on the earth that are important for life in general and effects on the earth that are particularly important from the perspective of humans. Okay, so climate change as caused by humans over the last couple of centuries is particularly, it's likely to be particularly devastating for humans because if you take, for example, simply the consequence of melting polar ice caps and uh, increased uh, level of the sea, given the positions of many cities very close to the sea at very low altitudes, uh, then this could be devastating for us. But the human caused climate change, um, people sometimes talk about it as more generally a sort of ecological catastrophe for the world. And in my view, that's simply not true because uh, over evolutionary time, there have been incredible changes in the climate and somehow ecosystems have survived perfectly well. Now, of course, some of them have been so drastic like the, 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 the almost like a nuclear winter caused uh, when the asteroid landed and, and sent the dinosaurs to their doom. Um, so this was horrendous and, and, and maybe something like 75% uh, of all species of life forms uh, went extinct at the same time as the dinosaurs. But in the long term, evolution sees that kind of extinction event as an opportunity and lots of new things evolve and ecosystems fix themselves and so on. So we have to be careful to distinguish between ecological catastrophe for everything, all life, and things that are dangerous for humans. Mm. And th th there's a sort of um, uh, a, a kind of irony in the fact that we humans are changing in the, the climate in ways that are particularly gonna be catas catastrophic for our own civilization. Yeah. Now, you could say, well, that serves us right. But <laughs> yeah. of course, hopefully what we'll do is find ways uh, to, um, I, as we are trying to do, of course, uh, at the moment, and, and, and it's good that this whole thing is very topical at the moment, we, we're trying to find ways of um, reducing our impact before it is completely catastrophic. Now, some people would say it's too late. I don't think it is too late. Uh, time will tell. Yeah. And, and it also, um, uh, you know, you make a, a comment in the book about um, how intelligence, as we as we think of it, doesn't necessarily correspond with the, su the success of the species over over the longest um, uh, possible period of time. So our view of our own intelligence, maybe we may have to reassess it somewhat if, if it turns out that we have we've evolved to the point where we're actually causing ourselves harm. Um, we've become more complex, so perhaps, but not necessarily um, more intelligent in a sort of evolutionary sense. <laughs> yes, um, if, we, if, we, if we engineer our own extinction, we're not very intelligent by definition, I guess. <laughs> exactly. Um, well, and hopefully we won't do that. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully we won't. But yeah, thank you so much for, for chatting today. It's been really, really um, interesting. Um, well, thank you for all your questions. I mean, I, I, I especially like the idea of, of hermit crabs evolving to use plastic vials. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out there and, and get looking for the, those new lines of evolution. Thanks very much, Rebecca. Lovely to chat. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye-bye.